Okay, so the fourth and final moment of the analytic of the beautiful is the judgment of taste according to what Kant calls modality. The modality of satisfaction in the object. So what does he mean by modality? Well, he's talking about the mode or the way in which there's a necessary satisfaction that one feels when one comes into the precinct of something beautiful. He's saying that the beautiful has a necessary reference to a particular kind of satisfaction that one feels. So what kind of necessity is this, this necessity between uh, this object and the satisfaction that I feel? I feel immediately, let's say, in looking upon a painting by Monet, the water lilies by Monet. As soon as I stand in the presence of that painting, I feel there's a necessary connection between that painting and this feeling of satisfaction that I'm experiencing. But what kind of necessity is it? This is what Kant wants to focus on in the fourth and final moment of his analytic of the beautiful. Well, he distinguishes it from a theoretical or a cognitive or logical. These are all synonyms for Kant, necessity. So if I say, um, Mon this is a painting by Monet, who was one of the great impressionists, of, of a great French impressionist painter. There's a necessity about that because anyone who has that concept Monet, Impressionism, painter, and it can be verified whether or not this painting is actually an authentic painting by Monet. Then those concepts, namely Monet, painter, Impressionism, French Impressionism, the whole thing, all of those are concepts. I mean, Monet is a real person and a painting is a painting, but the, to just use those words, Monet, this is a painting by Monet, who was a great French Impressionist. All that is a conceptual articulation, that's a cognitive judgment. So the universe, that can be universally val uh, valid. Anybody that knows those words and has those concepts and then uh, sees that painting will agree. There's a necessity there. That's called a theoretical objective necessity. And so everyone will agree if it's a true statement, what I'm saying. But since this kind of necessity in the beautiful and the satisfaction we feel is not a theoretical objective necessity, then everyone will not feel the same way. People are not going to agree. Some people may not like French Impressionism. They like something more realistic. They don't like it when the artist is taking liberties and showing things the way they see it, for example. So, so it's not going to give an objective necessity. And yet when we experience a, something beautiful, we feel this necessity and we assume that everyone ought to feel this way not exactly the same feeling I'm feeling. Of course, we're all different. We all have different feelings, but we all will feel this same sense of satisfaction, the same state of mind. So since the necessity is not a theoretical objective necessity, everyone will not in fact feel the same kind of satisfaction in the object called beautiful by me. It's not an empirical, necessity. The necessary satisfaction in the beautiful is not also a practical necessity. See, he's constantly showing how the realm of beauty is independent of theoretical knowledge, which he's been talking about throughout, how it's independent of morality. Something can be depicted as immoral, but at the same time be beautiful, like tragedies or watching um, you know, something that depicts some criminal or something. But if the, if the artwork is done beautifully, 
then it's still beautiful. So the necessary satisfaction in the object is not a practical necessity, as the feeling of respect is that accompany, accompanies the necessary legislation of concepts for a pure rational will serving the rule for freely acting beings. <laughs> That's his way of, he's thinking about what, and this takes us into his moral philosophy of the categorical imperative. He believes that the rational will will, insofar as it's rational, it will be obliged to act in accordance with moral laws. So that kind of necessity is a rational necessity. But we need not go into um, his moral philosophy. He's just trying to show how this necessity, wh what kind of necessity is it when I experience something beautiful and I feel that there's a necessary connection between this object and this feeling that I'm having. So the necessity is aesthetical, uh, the necessity of an aesthetic judgment. And so, Unlike theoretical or practical necessities, the theoretical is the cognitive um, necessity of something subsuming by necessity to a concept. And then the necessity of the um, practical is the necessity of a rational person acting in accordance with the law of reason, the categorical imperative. But the necessity, he says, of the beautiful is exemplary, exemplary. It is a necessity of the ascent of all to a judgment which is regarded as the example of a universal rule that cannot be stated. So this is so strange. So I, the way I understand it is this, I'm experiencing a piece of music or artwork or something from nature that I find beautiful. And I feel this necessary connection between this thing and this feeling that I'm having. Now I assume that others, and I impute to others that others ought to feel the same necessity. But on what grounds? On what grounds can I make that assumption? Is what he's asking about. Well, there's a universal rule here, but it can't be stated. So this has important practical uh, implications for art. You can't ever prove to someone that an artwork is beautiful. If someone doesn't like something and you like something, there's no way you can bridge that gap. Perhaps you could show them why you like it and you may pull them to your side or not, but there's no objective rule that you could give to say this work of art is objectively beautiful. In the same way you could say that this work of art is uh, an, ex an example of French Impressionism. That can be proven, but you can't prove to someone logically that something is beautiful. And yet, this is part of the experience of beauty for Kant. One of the conditions or the requirements of finding anything beautiful is to assume that others will find it beautiful. So now he's trying to think, what kind of rule is this that binds that allows me to to make such an assumption to impute to others that they ought to find it beautiful too well there's a universal rule but it can't be stated so there's a subjective necessity remember the aesthetic the beauty is in the subject who's experiencing the beauty you know I've tried to explain that a little bit. You know, there's this expression, I've said this before, but it, maybe it's worth saying again. Some people say beauty is in the eyes of the beholder. And usually what they mean when they say that is that what you may find beautiful, I don't consider beautiful, that it, to each his own, that beauty is relative, you know. Well, Kant's not gonna go along with that. Part of that is true, it is in the eyes of the beholder. In other words, it is subjective, but it's universal. And by universal, he means not everyone will in fact agree with you, but when you do experience something as beautiful, you assume that others will find it beautiful also. So he's, he's trying to think about this kind of necessity of 
what, on what basis can we make that assumption? Well, it's a subjective necessity and it's ascribed to the judgment of taste and it's conditional. It's not unconditional. See, the, the necessity of a thing coming onto, if I, if, you know, that this is a, a napkin, there's a certain necessity to that. It's unconditional. If you have the concept napkin and you see this thing, then you're forced to say it's a napkin because, you know, or so you have the concept napkin and the napkin determines the thing unconditionally. But the kind of necessity he's talking about is conditioned on something. So since the judgment of taste requires the agreement of everyone, at least we assume that others will agree, he who describes anything as beautiful claims that everyone ought. Now, that word is usually used in morality, what one ought to do. But here, it's an aesthetic ought. Like when I experience something beautiful, I have this sense that anyone who experiences this ought to feel it's beautiful too. If you stand before, before Monet's water lilies, you ought to feel that it's beautiful too. Now, you may not. See, that's the big difference. He's not talking about an empirical agreement. He's talking about the fact that when we do experience something as beautiful, we assume that others ought to describe it as beautiful also. But this ought in the judgment of taste is conditioned by something which is universal. So he's hunting for, he's going to announce it in this next section. What is it that allows me or anyone to say that they ought to find this same artwork beautiful or this same beauty in nature beautiful. What is it? Well, first of all, it's, it's a conditioned necessity that establishes this universal agreement. And so when we move to section 20, the condition of necessity, which a judgment of taste asserts is the idea of a common sense. So now this common sense is not something material, obviously. It's an idea and it's a regulative idea. Okay, it regulates things. It's, it's what's necessarily presupposed when anyone experiencing something is beautiful. Without this common sense, then there'd be no ground for my assuming that others should find something, the same thing beautiful. So what kind of common sense is it? There must be a subjective principle which determines what pleases and displeases, he says. A principle of this sort must be the condition of a universal assent. It must be the requirement for universal assent. Yet, it must not be a judgment by any concept. Such a principle, he claims, is common sense. But it's not, it's not common sense in the ordinary sense. Usually when people use the word common sense, they're speaking conceptually. Like, if it's raining, you know enough to bring an umbrella. You know? So usually when people talk about common sense, it's just not being stupid and doing that every, everyone simply knows how to do, uh, to do something. He's not talking about common sense that way. He's referring to a universal or a common effect resulting from the free play of our cognitive faculties, namely the imagination and the understanding. It is the ground of the determination of the ought of aesthetical judgments. It determines the necessity of the universal assent I feel this necessity that people should agree with me. Uh, it's not only the necessity of my feeling of pleasure in the thing, but the necessity that others ought to agree with me. That's what he means by the necessity. So unless I assume that there's this common sense, this universal voice that everyone shares in, something subjective and yet universal, then beauty judgments are impossible in principle.
because part of beauty judgments is to assume that others will find it beautiful also. So then he talks about this common sense. The cognition of judgments are to admit of communicability. So now he wants to give uh, in section 21, what reasons, you know, Kant's a, a logic teacher and logicians know that when you make an argument, you have to have premises or s something to support your claim. So he's claiming that there's such a thing as this common sense that's assumed every time anyone experiences anything as beautiful. And one of the reasons he gives for positing that is that there could be no assumption on anyone's part that others should find something beautiful unless there was this, uh, uh, this regulative principle that there's a common sense that pervades all human beings. And so one of the reasons he gives for positing this common sense is that the cognitions and judgments are to be admitted of communicability. In other words, we can communicate to others this feeling of beauty that we experience in seeing something beautiful. The cognitions and judgments are to admit of communicability and so must the state of mind admit, admit of communicability. In other words, I need to somehow articulate or communicate to others this feeling, this state of mind that I'm experiencing when I stand in the presence of something beautiful. So since the state of mind is this harmonious free play and this augmentation of our faculties of the imagination and the understanding, since the state of mind of the harmonious free play of the cognitive faculties necessitates a universal communicability that I can communicate this to others, and since this communicability necessarily presupposes a common sense among humans, these are the grounds for assuming a common sense. In section 22, he summarizes everything he's been talking about uh, so far. <clears throat> the principle of a subjective universal common sense allows for and makes possible the communicability of the feeling of pleasure, of being pleased, which is assumed to be necessary for everyone. And so the feeling can claim universal assent as to the objective beauty of the object. He's saying that it's really a subjective necessity, but we speak as though it were objective. And so he concludes the fourth moment the beautiful is that which, without any concept, is cognized, is understood, as the object of a necessary satisfaction. Okay. The necessities between this feeling I'm having and what I behold as beautiful and this necessary connection between what I'm feeling and what I assume others ought to feel, although empirically they may not feel the same way. They may not agree. There's a general remark of the first section of the analytic of the beautiful. Oh, <clears throat> there's that there, after the analytic of the beautiful, then Kant has a transition to the sublime. So while the beautiful is focused on form, and Kant is a formalist when it comes to aesthetics and art. When it comes to beauty, he's called a formalist because he emphasizes form. It's the form of a work of art that makes it beautiful or the form of things that make it beautiful. So he's a formalist. 
and but when it comes to the sublime it's an expression of something boundless and formless see form has limits the boundless is limitless so when we experience something sublime in art or in nature then it's a ex experience of the boundlessness of something and he has very detailed and one of wonderful uh, um, articulation of the second moment of the analytic or the second part of the analytic, the aesthetic uh, part of his book is called the analytic of the sublime, but we won't go into that. But there's a general remark that I find quite helpful at the end of the analytic of the beautiful and he, he speaks generally about his notion of beauty. And he speaks about the imagination. And so when we're experiencing something beautiful, let me try to summarize this for you, that, um, this, re this general remark he gives at the end. He calls this the reflective judgment. So it's different from cognitive judgments. So, to get a hold of Kant, you want to see the difference between cognitive judgments and aesthetic judgments or judgments of taste. It's different from judgments of the pleasant, which are bound up with interest and desire. It's different from moral judgments, which have to do with esteeming something that is respectable morally and from the good as useful, different from seeing something as perfect. And so he's distinguishing, he's, he's showing how judgments of taste are different from all these other kinds of judgments. And so he's adumbrating this realm of the, of the beautiful by showing how it's different from everything else. It's similar to cognitive judgments because it's universal. I mean, we have a, a sense of, universality there. What, what is universal about aesthetic judgments? The fact that we find that everyone ought to find this beautiful also, we assume that. But it's subjective, not objective. It, and so because of that, it's not a cognitive judgment. It's similar to the judgments of taste, they're similar to judgments of the pleasant in that they're both subjective like when it comes to food and drink and what kind of um, sensuous pleasures people prefer, those are all subjective and people don't agree about that. But they're particular, whereas the aesthetic judgment, the judgments of taste, they too are subjective, like judgments of the pleasant, but they're universal. And so he, he shows how they're different and the same but in this uh, general remark at the end, he talks about, um, he talks more freely about what he's talking about in the an analytic of the beautiful. And one of the things I find uh, interesting and fascinating is he states that the faculty for judging an object in reference to the imagination in this free is a free conformity to law. So what he means by that is, Usually, he's got two kinds of imaginations he's talking about. One is, is called the reproductive imagination. And so what he means by that is part of the faculties of human being is to have this synthesizing power of our, of our mental apparatus, our cognitive powers. There's something in, in the mind of humans that synthesizes things. And by synthesize, he means it, it brings, back, it brings the, the, um, the sense stimuli together under a particular rule. Like, um, okay, this is a big, <laughs> my father-in-law bought us this big pepper grinder. Okay, so there it is, pepper grinder. And um, so if you have the concept pepper grinder and you look at this thing, the imagination synthesizes the stimuli that are, that are bombarding our senses, but not randomly. 
it's doing it in accordance with the concept pepper grinder. And so, boom, as soon as we look at it, we see a pepper grinder. So the imagination is working, but it's reproducing the stimuli and synthesizing it in the form of a pepper grinder or a table or a tree or a dog or whomever, whatever. That's called the reproductive imagination. It's working, it's working together with the, un, with the concepts that we have in our understanding. Now, there's another kind of imagination that he talks about here, which perked up my ears. He calls it the, the productive imagination. So what is that? Well, instead of reproducing the stimuli, what it does is produce, it's working according to law. But instead of the, imagine, instead of the imagination working for the understanding, the understanding is working for the imagination. So that's why, for example, when I was talking about Gene Kelly dancing and he jumped up on the uh, lamppost and he looked like a bird landing, how birds can land so, so lightly onto things. But he's a human being. Usually humans are not so light on their feet, right? But a dancer like Gene Kelly is. So he can jump up on the lamppost and just land there lightly like a bird. Well, now Gene Kelly becomes a bird. So a bird is a concept, but my imagination conjured the bird. And so now Gene Kelly becomes the bird, like a bird, right? So now what's happening is my understanding is following the orders of my imagination and I'm producing something new. Now the dancer, Gene Kelly, it, it doesn't even, you don't need his name. You know, the character in the film after, you know, it's just this man dancing. And then after a while, it's not even a man dance. At that moment, it wasn't a man dancing, it was a bird landing on the lamppost. So what's happening is the imagination is producing something. It's in, it, in this free play that takes place in our experiencing of the beautiful, the imagination is not taking, is not second fiddle to the understanding. The understanding is doing what the imagination is saying. And they're working in harmony with each other. And the two are enhancing each other. And then there's this feeling of harmony that takes place. And it's this feeling this, that we want to communicate with others. And so I want to take that, you know, that scene. You can watch it, actually. It's on YouTube. Just look, uh, Singing in the Rain, and Gene Kelly dancing sing, and singing in the rain. It, it can be anything. So. By imagination, Kant does not mean the reproductive imagination when he's talking in this um, remark at the end, but rather the productive and the spontaneous imagination. As the author, this productive imagination is the author of arbitrary forms of possible intuitions, okay? And here he's just using the, the word intuition as an immediate apprehension of something. So there's a freedom here. There's a conformity to law, namely a bird is a bird. And so the imagination is conforming to that law, like that example I gave you of the dancer becoming a bird, or like a bird. So boom, the bird is being, there's a, there's a determination Imagine the understanding is saying a bird and boom, it becomes a bird. But it was the imagination that told the understanding to conjure the bird. And so there's a freedom here. So he talks of the productive imagination in this free play. The understanding alone gives the law, which is not a law. It's the subjective agreement of the imagination and the understanding. But Kant contends here, the understanding is at the service of the imagination and not vice versa. So I found that to be fascinating. The free conformity to law. The law comes from the side of the concepts, but it's free because the imagination is telling the understanding what concepts it wants to be determined by. This free conformity to law is the peculiar feature of the judgment of taste, 
of what he calls the reflective judgment as we contemplate and marvel at something and linger on something that we find beautiful. And then there's transition to the sublime and he has an equally in-depth articulation of the sublime. So I find in even, um, I, since I've been doing this for so long, the language that Kant uses is difficult, even for a seasoned philosopher. But I do find it worthwhile to, even if you can't follow Kant and all of the subtle points of his deep reflections on things, if you can just l uh, latch on to the key ideas. And you can do that by taking that, take that one, the way I would appreciate, uh, if I were an undergraduate and I were uh, studying this, I would take those four sentences that summarize each of the four moments of the analytic of the beautiful, and I would just write them down and type them out, put them there. And then this is the gist of it all, okay? And then reread each section or the sections that um, correspond to the, each moment. And just try to find those parts that you do understand that help to shine light on that sentence that summarizes that moment, okay? And there'll be a lot that you don't, you can't follow him because it's so convoluted and so abstract and so abstruse. But there'll be a lot that you do understand. And that part you do understand, mark it, and then try to paraphrase it. Try to put it into your own words, okay? So I'm quite forgiving when, our, when philosophers try to uh, use uh, atrocious language to, you know, a lot of people complain, why can't they just say something in plain English? Well, well he's German, that he's, so he's speaking German, you know, so that's not his native tongue, but that's not the answer. The an and, and even if he were speaking English, it still would be hard. I mean, some of the sentences, some of the sentences are like two pages long, one sentence. You know, and no one writes like that anymore. But um, I'm forgiving because philosophers are opening up new ways of seeing. If you think about it, it's very difficult to talk about beauty in a in a diff in a deep way, you know, in a serious deep way at a at the level of philosophy at at the level of a great thinker like Kant. And and so I think Kant takes us a long ways in helping us to understand beauty and what's going on, what are the, what are the requisite um, conditions that make possible our experience of something beautiful. And it helps to orient ourselves through life because we can put ourselves in the proper posture then to understand things. I, I can't tell you how many times, how many museums I've been in, how many monuments and places I've been. I made it a point to go to these places in my life and I'm really happy I did that. I really recommend if you love to travel and if you love beauty and art and then go to these places and uh, and you wouldn't believe how many times i've seen people obsessed with uh confusing the cognitive theoretical part from the actual experience i've seen people waiting in line look one that jumps into my mind right now and then i'll stop because i'll go on all day uh, okay, we're in Rome. There's this charming, it's not a great cathedral, it's a church um, in Rome. And there's a, a painting, or there's a piece of sculpture by Bernini called The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. It's one of the most beautiful pieces of sculpture I've ever seen. And Bernini is one of the great sculptors of all time. And it's in a niche in this, it's so beautiful. People just line up, <laughs> it has nothing to, it's not about religion or anything. The church is like a, a, I mean, people come there and pray and everything, but mostly it's like, that's where Bernini's statue of St. Teresa, um, the ecstasy of St. Teresa. And you can see it uh, if you Google it, but it's not the same, obviously, right? I've seen people in line, they come, they wait in line, to see this piece of sculpture. And then they look to see, okay, it's Bernini. And there it is. And, but it was enough to, it was enough to know this was Bernini and this is the St. Teresa in ecstasy. And then they barely looked at the painting or uh, that 
um, that's one example. There's so many others. People in, um, in, with guides who are listening to the guide standing at, in the Roman Forum. Everyone just looking at the guide, and you only have like 20 minutes maybe to walk through the Roman Forum. No one looking at the Roman Forum, just listening to what the guide is saying, and all that knowledge you can get in any souvenir shop you know, walking down the street or in any library. It just goes, I, I can go on and on how many times I've experienced that. So Kant taught me, I, I probably would have, some people are sort of in between, they listen to the guide and they look, you know, and the guide helps because they, they get them to see things that they haven't seen before and so on. But um, the way I go about it is before I go somewhere, I try to learn as much about that place and those things that are there that I want to see. So that way I don't need a guide to, you know, you, you can read up on it and know probably the cutting edge stuff even more than the guides even because new, new, they're, they're probably saying the same thing they've been saying for the last 10 years and there's been new research and you can get all that just by checking it out yourself. And so you don't really need the guide. And then you can pay attention to like experiencing the artwork and it doesn't matter what Pope made what um, church or anything. It matters that you stand in the cathedral and you feel like you're taking in, in heaven, you know, if you're standing in the Duomo of, of um, Bernini and the Santa Maria di Fiori in, in Florence, it doesn't matter who made it. I mean, it's nice to know Bernini did the Duomo and how he made it and everything. And again, I've talked about that before. I do believe that the more you know about, be about art or about nature, it will enhance your experience. I'll, I'll, I'll go that far. But I do believe that there is this free play going on. And the imagination has to play freely with the understanding. You can't have the understanding dominating things. Otherwise, you don't need to be in the cathedral. You can go in the library and read about it. So th th that's a test for me. If, if there's a difference between going to the library or Googling the Duomo by Bruno, uh, Brunelleschi, or if there's a difference between that and going into the theater, uh, in, into the cathedral, and there's so many other things you can do. You can climb up and there's the whole last judgment uh, painted on the ceiling and so on. It's just so incredible. If there's a difference between Googling it and walking in, then there's something to what Khan is saying. Because if it were cognitive judgments, there would be no difference. You just stay in the library and read about it, and that's all you would need. But there's something abysmally different about walking into the cathedral, okay? So Kant helped me there in, in so many other ways. I don't accept everything myself. You know, again, the way to approach philosophy is just when you're reading it and studying it, you just try to understand what this author is saying, and usually, that takes all of your effort. You don't want to start criticizing things before you, you know, uh, before you understand it. Then once you feel like you're in, you, you're in the neighborhood of the author's intention, then of course you need to evaluate it. That's called critical thinking. And like Kant plays down the emotional part the, and the sensuous qualities and the colors and things like that. He's a purely formalist. And I don't go, that, I don't go along with him on that. But he, I've learned some of the other things from him. I find it worthwhile to do that. And then you go to the next one who's more, more of an expressionist in art and so on. And you learn something from this person. And as time goes by, um, it, and by actually going to these places and experiencing art, and then and I, I know I'm focusing mostly on art, but in nature also, we find the beautiful and the sublime. There's also art, the artwork where there's no artist, where God is the artist. And that's another thing. All right, so that's the best I can do right now on The Analytic of the Sublime by Immanuel Kant. All right? All right.